believes that country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape, an intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney, to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast. From freshwater, to bitter water, to salt. From city, to urban, to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonisation on our campus's footprint. And commit ourselves to truth telling, healing and education. Thank you for that acknowledgement of country. Good afternoon. My name's Professor David Curro, and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Sustainable Futures at the University of Wollongong. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here today to the latest, latest edition of our Luminaries series. Luminaries brings together leading University of Wollongong researchers, industry experts, and thought leaders for an in-depth conversation and insights. We discover how research and collaboration at the University of Wollongong is tackling global challenges. And in this episode, we will investigate climate change. At the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris, and that was COP21, governments agreed that mobilizing stronger and more ambitious climate action was urgently required. The Paris Agreement formally acknowledged the critical need to scale up our global response to climate change. To coincide with the COP28 conference currently happening in Dubai, we will hear from three of the University of Wollongong's climate researchers who will discuss how and why we should listen to the earth about climate change. Now it's time to meet our panelists for this luminary session. Professor Helen McGregor is a paleoclimatologist who has made substantial advances in understanding humanity's most serious threats to global cl climate change and the human climate environment impacts. Professor McGregor is in the University of Wollongong School of Earth, Atmospheric and Life Sciences, is a chief investigator on the Australian Research Council's Special Research Initiative on Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future, and leads an Australian Research Council discovery project investigating climate change and environmental impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. Associate Professor Andrew Zamet Manjian is an associate professor with the University of Wollongong School of Mathematics and Applied Statistics. He is chief investigator on a discovery project estimating the sources and sinks of greenhouse gases and on a special research initiative on securing Antarctic, Antarctica's environmental futures. He is also the data science coordinator on an Australian Research Council Industrial Transformation Research Hub project on transforming energy infrastructure through digital engineering. Associate Professor Nicholas Deutscher is an atmospheric scientist interested in a range of topics related to measuring, modeling, and understanding the evolution of Earth's atmosphere. His primary focus is measuring and modeling atmospheric greenhouse gases and developing and improving techniques. Today, please submit any questions you have through the Q&A function. We will try to get through as many of those questions towards the end of this session as possible. So as we think about these issues, uh, let me start with your work, Helen. Can you explain what your research has shown us about the history of the climate around the world and why we should listen to the environment about climate change? 
Yeah, thank you, David. Thanks for that welcome. So my broad research field is paleoclimate, which is climate of the past. And at a really big picture level, the research in, in my broad field has shown that relationship between temperature, carbon dioxide, and then what those two things increasing and the relationship between them, what that means for sea level change. And then from there, a whole bunch of processes and consequences that we really can't see by just looking at the records we have at the moment. So it's really that, that big picture um, use and, and relationships that are going to help us forecast what's going to come in the future. And then why should we do this? Well, you know, if we don't know, we want to try and minim minimise risk and, and have le less surprises in the future. So in terms of specific examples, Helen, um, what, what have you found in, uh, in those relationships that, to, to which we can relate? Yeah, so one of the things we've looked at is um, ocean temperatures and how how and when ocean temperatures have changed as carbon dioxide levels have changed in the last few hundred years. So what was the relationship before we had industrialization and then what have been the drivers then and then what are the how that's changed and, and when different parts of the planet have changed. Uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect sort of more recently, and I've got lots of threads going on, but most recently, we've been looking at ocean temperatures in the Great Barrier Reef. We're all seeing mass bleaching. Uh, and this is with my postdoc, Ben Henley. Um, we've been looking at how unpre unprecedented are these temperatures? We're all worried about bleaching on the reef and warm ocean temperatures. And we've been able to look back in time and see, answer that question, are they, are they unusual? And um, I don't know, should I give some spoilers maybe later? Uh, spoiler alert, go for it now. Well, what we've been finding is that when we look back 400 years, the temperatures the reef has experienced in the last decade or so are unprecedented. And, um, you know, linking in with Andrew's sort of stats side of things, we've been looking at that statistically as well. Is that a statistically robust finding? And, and so far, it looks like it is, which is a, a terrible thing for the reef itself. Truly frightening. So, uh, Nick, uh, you work in the field of atmospheric measurement. What is that? And tell us a little about your work. Yeah, thanks, David, and welcome, everyone. So what is atmospheric measurement? Well, it means a whole lot of things, actually. We, um, we go out and make take samples of, of the air and, and measure it to determine what concentrations of gases and so forth there are in that particular bit of air. Um, but we do this on a whole heap of different scales. So um, starting from small and working up, for example, um, one of the areas of interest is, is how coastal ecosystems will evolve and respond to climate change. And we've been doing some work with, with coastal researchers to go in and measure on very small scales. So these are uh, chambers that we put over a certain area of an ecosystem trap the gas over the top of it and we're measuring sort of within less than a cubic meter of air what exchange happens with the surface of the earth so that's something that's really really small scale and you can look at how things change as you go from for example from a mangrove um, through salt marshes up to um, to coastal forests um, and that gives us really small scale understanding of what's going on we also use techniques where we can do things like look at um, what we would term either field or facility scales. So we might go and, and these always tend to happen in really, really stinky, smelly environments. Um, <laughs> so we might go and look at, you know, what a, a herd of cattle are burping out and it's mostly burping, not farting that, that, that cows do. Um, it might be a, a pile of manure um, or it might be measuring from a... Um, something like a coal mine sort of facility scale. So you're getting then an understanding on something that's, you know, hundreds of metres to a kilometre squared. Um, then we, one of the, the ways of measuring that's historically been used a lot for atmospheric composition is um, to take samples from a tower. Um, so it might be, a, it's usually a, a tower that's measuring maybe 10 metres off the ground, at least 10 metres off the ground. Uh, where you sample in the air um, at that tower from an inlet, analyze it for composition, 
Uh, and then you try and look at how representative that is of, of an area of the atmosphere. So maybe some people have heard of the measurements at Mauna Loa, one of the famous records for tracking CO2 in the atmosphere comes from Mauna Loa. That's the sort of measurement they make there and they choose a place like Mauna Loa because it's representative of a broad region. So you're not really looking at very, very localized things. You're getting something that's where there's no big um, sources or sinks. So things that either put CO2 or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere or take it out within a very close region. Um, so you can sample there and say, this is representative of um, a broad region even up to global scales if you if you choose the conditions right. And then finally, and probably I've forgotten a bunch of the things that we do, but finally we also take measurements where we look through the entire vertical extent of the atmosphere. Um, and this has, again, some benefits in terms of being able to look at things that are representative of a of large region. Um, but one of the key benefits of that is so if you put out a network of these sites sampling from 10 metre towers, for example, there are places you can't go and measure. Um, if you were to look at a map on the globe, there are very few measurements in Africa, very few in Russia, um, very few in, actually very few in Australia as well. We only have sort of um, three or four measurement sites for Australia and that's for the, re the size of Australia, that's, that's pretty poor. Um, but we can supplement them with satellite measurements. And satellites are generally looking at sunlight that's reflected off the Earth's surface. Um, and so we can make the same type of measurements at the surface of the Earth looking at the sun. So we're looking through the entire extent of the atmosphere. Uh, and University of Wollongong, myself and colleagues, we run a couple of sites within, the, within a network called the Total Carbon Column Observing Network. Um, that is the primary um, the gold standard for validating greenhouse gas measurements from satellites. And the satellites, of course, can give us much better spatial coverage um, than you can get from, from just measuring at one particular point on the Earth's surface. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. It's burping, not farting, mostly. <laughs> You're not making that part of your job sound terribly attractive, I've got to say, Nick. Um, beyond carbon dioxide, are you measuring anything else uh, in, uh, in, in the atmosphere and, and tracking it over time? Yeah, so networks like the Total Carbon Column Observing Network or these um, in-situ measurements that are measuring from the towers, a lot of them will measure many other things in the atmosphere. Um, so in a greenhouse gas perspective, uh, all the sites that we run, the techniques that we use, we can also measure methane and nitrous oxide, which are the two next most important after carbon dioxide. Uh, we can often also measure carbon monoxide, um, which people might be familiar with as, as a product of, of incomplete combustion. So it comes out of the back of your car or it comes from fires and various other different sources. Um, so while it's not a direct greenhouse gas, it's it's very much related to some of the processes that produce greenhouse gases. So it's it's a really useful thing to measure uh, to give us a flag for which particular things might be, you know, sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff as well that we're measuring. Um, we've got a long history in measuring uh, things related to ozone depletion, for example. The, the stratospheric ozone hole. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks for that, uh, Nick. Um, over to you, Andrew. Uh, you're the statistician in all of this. Um, so what do you do and uh, what's it like accessing live climate data from NASA? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, David, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, so yes, uh, you, you mentioned NASA. So uh, here, at, uh, I'm a member of the National Institute for Applied Statistics Research Australia, NIASRA, here at the University of Wollongong. Uh, we have a group who's part of a NASA science team. Uh, it's, it's called the OCO science team, and OCO is short for Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Uh, so this, is, this science team is a group of people from all around the world, uh, maybe a few dozen to, to 100 people who do science with data collected from the satellite, which is called Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2. This is a NASA satellite um, and it's an Earth observation satellite. It looks down. So, so Nick was talking about uh, instruments which look up through the atmosphere and these satellites are looking down through the atmosphere instead. 
Uh, these satellites are, are really impressive machines. Uh, this, this one in particular, OCO2, it goes around the Earth, I believe, uh, 14 times a day and collects about a million measurements of carbon dioxide per day. Uh, so th there's really a lot of, of data to deal with. Uh, and this is, this is what uh, statisticians uh, do in a nutshell. They start off with data and then try to, to make inferences uh, from it. It, it. It's not very different from having a survey or some census data and then trying to make inferences on the economy or well-being of a population, say. So, so um, re returning to the data, we've got this, these really massive data sets. And, we have uncertainties all over the place that we need to deal with. Um, these measurements are uncertain, they have biases. Um, there, is, there are uncertainties because uh, when we really want to estimate fluxes, which are sources and sinks of carbon dioxide from the satellite data. And to do this, we need to link the measurements to what are known as transport models, which are models of how the gas is circulating into the atmosphere. And these have their own errors and their own uncertainty. Um, I like to think of statistics as the science of uncertainty. Uh, this is what we're trained to do. We're trying to make inferences in the presence of uncertainty. And, and what we do is uh, try to make inferences on, say, how, how much carbon dioxide is being emitted or absorbed at a given place and at a given time uh, based on satellite data, but also, but also in situ data like, like Nick was talking about. So we try to combine everything together to come up with estimates. So having crunched those literally millions of data points, what are they telling you about the climate at the moment, Andrew? Well, so first of all, I should say that it's a, it's a very difficult process to go from these observations of how much concentration of carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere to actually say, where is, where is it coming from and, and where is it going? So I, I like to think of this as a, as a detective's work. Um, so you, you've got, you've seen these carbon dioxide molecules, um, but we try to go backwards in time to see where they came from or, or where they're going. And uh, the way we do this is using atmospheric transport models, as I said. So let's say we've observed a big concentration of carbon dioxide over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and if the wind has been blowing from the west, then you can probably conclude that this was emitted by the US. And if it's blowing from the east, then probably it came from Europe. This is a very simplistic caricature of, of what we're doing. Um, carbon dioxide mixes in, in the atmosphere pretty quickly. So, so trying to make these conclusions is, is very difficult. Um, ju just to give some idea of how, how we make this work, what we end up with with these transport models is essentially a very large set of equations that we need to solve. Um, many of us may remember um, in our HSC days having to solve two equations and two unknowns. Um, simultaneous equations. Simultaneous equations. That's that is a use for them. That's fantastic. <laughs> so it's exactly like this, except that we have millions of equations and maybe thousands or tens of thousands of unknowns. Um, and, and we need high performance computing to, to solve for these. But, but it's essentially the same principle. Um, so and, and once we solve these equations, the solutions would tell us how much was emitted or absorbed by a certain location on Earth uh, at a certain time point. Um, so at Wollongong, actually, we've built a system. It's called Wombat, which is short for the Wollongong methodology for assimilation of, of trace gases um, that, that we use, but is also being used by other other people uh, worldwide. Um, but but yeah, back, back to your original question, I mean, it, it, it's very hard to to drill down where exactly um, you know precisely uh, how much is being emitted by a certain region at a certain point in time but you can get pretty big pictures and of course you get you the the big emitters of course us china they pop up and and if you just look at the global trend uh, it's obviously um, very increasing <laughs> the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and and our our framework essentially corroborates those findings yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, back to you, Nick. Um, particularly in the light of COP28 meeting at the moment in Dubai, uh, how do countries benefit from these measurements, from these estimates, and, and how can countries respond uh, to some of the findings that we're discussing today? Yeah, so as Andrew was discussing, 
basically we can take measurements like satellite measurements that are validated by ground-based measurements and use a, in what we would call an inverse process, basically a process that's taking the transport backwards to see where the molecules came from and do things like determine what a country's emissions of CO2 are. Um, and that's that's very useful for countries. So in a lot of cases, um, historically, countries have estimated their emissions based on what we would call bottom-up data or what people might know of as emissions inventories. So this is doing things like taking the amount of coal that a coal-fired power plant burns, some assumptions about how much CO2 is emitted per tonne of coal and scaling that up. And a lot of times that can miss a lot of what's going on. The assumptions might not hold valid 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, or it might be there are other processes. So there's there's things like, and I'm going to go with coal mines again, where you look at coal mines. Um, so we've probably all heard of coal seam gas and the emissions that come from coal seam gas. Um, but if you go out to a coal mine, you've got tailings dams, you've got seams of coal, you've got old vents. A lot of these things aren't well captured in um, in these bottom up processes in the, the the you know the process of estimating scaling from from a process up to a full country scale. Whereas the things we do, the measurements we take, contribute to getting what we would call a top down estimate. So that's that's looking at a measurement of what's happening in the atmosphere and saying, oh. You know, it changed by 100,000 molecules. Those 100,000 molecules must have come from somewhere. And so we know very well what's happened in the atmosphere and therefore what must have been emitted to the atmosphere. And we can break that down to, to the scales of individual countries and tell them that information to say, you know, this is how much your country is emitting, which gives them a basis to work on to say, you know, if we want to reach net zero, this is what we need to reduce our emissions by. And then some of the other work we're doing, things like going and measuring the stinky piles of manure, um, as horrible as it sounds, you know, that, that can be very, very valuable information for identifying processes. And in some cases we've done work like where we will go and measure a herd of cattle and looked at do two different feed regimes um, and see which one is, is most effective for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Those sort of things can contribute to reducing the emissions um, on a practical scale. A lot of the times for things like that, it, you know, it also helps the farmer because it means, you know, they, they can find out this particular type of feed. I'm not wasting my money on this. This is going efficiently into fattening up my cows or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and we can do that and, and sort of identify areas where there are potential avenues to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, and, and feed that through to, to policy makers and to industries and industry partners and bodies to, to help reduce emissions. And just to follow on from that, Nick, are, are countries, industries, emitters actually listening as they get that feedback? Um. So it has been a hard process in a lot of cases. Um, I'm starting now to really see a change in what is happening. Um, some industries have really traditionally been good. So we, we talk about agriculture um, and because they can see a real benefit in a lot of cases in terms of, you know, it might be associated with reduced fertilizer usage, which is one one of the sources of greenhouse gases. Uh, if they can reduce fertilizer usage, that chain, that saves them money. So they can be very um, early adopters of things that they, they can see as beneficial. Some other industries, not naming names, um, are perhaps a bit reluctant to take things on board, but I am starting to see a, a change and perhaps Hopefully, maybe I'm optimistic, hopefully more willingness to, to adapt and, and make some changes. And at national government level? Yes, so we've, we've definitely had some interest from things like the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. They're very much interested in, in knowing and enacting um, 
enacting policy to try to both monitor and then reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's it's really a, a field at the moment that's evolving, um, I think, and hope quite quite quickly. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nick. Helen, um, given your particular lens on this, because what we've got today are three different lenses on the same problem, uh, what are you able to do to, to listen, as it were, uh, to the environment? And uh, in that listening, what have you found? Yeah, so I guess one really important example that links to what both Nick and Andrew have been talking about is we talk about 1.5 degree warming, but relative to what and relative to when? And if we look at our instrumental records, we've only really had the satellites um, for about 40 years in, in a reliable kind of way, for contributing data. And we go back to measurements that people were making and, and the further back in time, the more sparse they become. So by the time you get back to about 1900, before that, the records aren't that reliable. So that's when we have to start kicking in to use the paleoclimate records to sort of say, well, we know industrialization, you know, was occurring. What is our baseline? And I think paleoclimate records are starting to contribute in that area. Um, some of the things we do in particular is, is we use coral actually to reconstruct the climate. Uh, so corals, as they grow, they produce growth bands, you know, about a centimetre a year. And the chemistry of, of those growth bands changes with ocean temperature, changes with rainfall. Uh, and we can pick up things like um, rare earth elements give a pollution signal. So we can really start to have a real record of what those corals have lived through. Some of them live for several hundred years, so we can sort of collect one today and take a small core today and go back in time. The other thing we can do is, is there's places in the world where we find, we call them fossil corals. They're not true fossils, but they've been preserved and they'll give us a window or a snapshot into what's been happening hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years ago. And the, the, you know, corals are they're really amazing and really useful in this regard. They they can the, the ocean temperatures, for example, change when we have something like an El Nino event. We're going into an El Nino event now, we're sort of wondering, well, how frequently do these things occur? Um, our records are really short. El Nino is very noisy. Andrew's talked about uncertainties. Our, our records around El Nino are uncertain. So we can use these, these corals from various parts of the world to reconstruct that bigger picture and have a look at how does the natural, what is the sort of natural drivers of El Nino? What are they? Are they? Are there any drivers? Is it just a random occurrence that happens as a way of the climate system organizing itself? Or does it respond? You know, so if we do put more carbon dioxide in dioxide into the atmosphere will we have a consequence in terms of El Nino events so that's sort of one way we've been listening um, we there's a lot of uncertainty around Antarctica and the rates at which the ice sheets will melt uh, ice sheets change on really long time scales so again if we just look at the recent past we don't have that longer term perspective um, where the paleoclimate stuff can, can kick in and fill that gap. And, and one thing we're learning is El Nino events, for example, do have knock-on effects um, for how much snow uh, falls in Antarctica and therefore how much um, how you can build a glacier and the like. So, so these are the kind of stories we can start to tease out actually by blending the recent data sets that we've got, the sort of things that Andrew and, and Nick are generating and combining it with the paleoclimate data. So uh, that's a great segue to uh, Antarctica and uh, your work, Andrew. Um, I know that you've been doing uh, some work on seeing how much uh, the melt in Antarctica, Antarctica is contributing to uh, the rise in sea level. I think we've all seen in the last uh, little while uh, uh, news of a 4,000 square kilometer iceberg setting sail, which is just uh, unbelievable to even contemplate. Um, so what can you tell us about sea level rise and, uh, and uh, you know, is that going to be linear or exponential? 
<laughs> but so um, uh, linear exponential, that's a good question, David. It, it really depends on, on what's going to happen in the next uh, 20, 30 years um, with regards to, 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 to adaptation and uh, to how, how the Earth will be warming. Um, but uh, going back to, to what I have done in this space, I've really looked at uh, current at uh, contemporary measurements. Uh, so in the last, let's say, 15, 15 years, um, this is work that I started at the University of Bristol in England about uh, about 10 years ago. And, and the, the main the main idea of this project was trying to use satellite data to figure out uh, how much mass Antarctica is losing. So uh, when Antarctica loses mass, it, the ice is on the ground. Uh, when that melts, it goes into the ocean. It's, it's very different from when we talk like, talking about sea ice. Uh, sea ice is uh, ice which forms on the sea, so it doesn't really change sea level. The sea level, uh, but ice which is on the land when it melts, it goes into the ocean, and that is what causes sea level rise. So. Um, it, it's actually quite difficult uh, to, to see what's going on in Antarctica. It's, it's a remote place. Um, it's very hard to get measurements um, of the ice itself, uh, but uh, remote sensing satellites have really changed the way we do things. So the, the way we tackled this problem was we used a, a bunch of satellites. Um, altimetry satellites can tell you how, how much the, ice, the surface of the ice sheet is going up or down from year to year. Uh, and there are also what are called gravimetry satellites. Uh, these would be twin satellites. I'm thinking of the GRACE experiment here, where these would be orbiting around the Earth. They are connected together via laser link. And uh, depending on gravitational anomalies, they are getting closer together or further apart. So, so actually, we can detect uh, if a place on, on, on Earth is losing mass or gaining mass. So if, if Antarctica is losing mass, it will actually come up as a gravitational anomaly. Um, so, but again, this is a very difficult problem because um, just because you observe a change in height, let's say uh, the, 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 the surface of the ice has gone up by three centimeters this year, uh, it doesn't mean that the ice has become thicker, maybe there was more snowfall. So we actually have to use both altimetry and gravimetry together and take into account the different densities of ice and snow in order to tease out what is happening. Was this due to a snowfall or is, what, or is this the ice thinning or thickening? Uh, and again, this boils down, as you can imagine, to a big system of simultaneous <laughs> equations. I'm kind of boi I'm boiling it down here, but essentially it, it does boil down to a lot of linear algebra. Um, and, and then we try to resolve with what is happening to, to the ice sheet. So um, ice sheets are the biggest contributor to sea level rise. There are other sources of sea level rise, like turbine expansion, uh, but ice sheets and glaciers, uh, Greenland and Antarctica, mostly are the biggest source of sea level rise. And, and I believe latest estimates are that in the last 30 years, uh, these have contributed to about uh, two centimeters of uh, sea level rise. And, and that is quite a lot, of course. It's just in the space of, of uh, 30 years. Um, so, so yeah, uh, so the framework that we, de that we developed is, is still being used nowadays. It's again, very statistic and it takes into account uncertainties, both in the data measurement process, but also in our understanding of the physical mechanisms. And so two centimeters, but some of the projections for the next 70 or, or 80 years, um, certainly move, uh, uh, a long way beyond, uh, centimeters. What does the future look like? So it, it does depend on what happens. So for example, the West Antarctic ice sheet is, uh, is below sea level. Most of it is below sea level. So if there's a collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, that could cause a big sudden rise in sea level in a very short amount, relatively uh, short amount of time. So, so I think I think it's just fair to say that the future is really uncertain. Um, there, there are best tests, there are best uh, guesses, and uh, there are worst possible cases and best possible cases. But they all point towards a, a significant sea level rise in the next fifty years. Yeah. So that uh, West Antarctica ice sheet, uh, when you say quite quickly are we talking weeks months years decades do you think if it collapses uh it depends yeah. on the way it collapses as well i i can't say for for certain but um uh, the west antarctic ice sheet has the possible uh, can increase the sea level by many many centimeters um i forgot exactly maybe even meters um but but yeah uh, this this would be over a prolonged period of time not weeks or months yeah Thank you for that. Um, 
And so let's just uh, bring it back to the University of Wollongong. Uh, what are the strengths of what we're doing here at the University of Wollongong on understanding climate change and sustainability? And where could we make the biggest impact in terms of solutions for what we face? And I I open that up to uh, to you first, Helen, but I'd welcome comments from all of you. Yeah, look, I think one of Wollongong's real strengths in this area is, well, an enthusiastic bunch of students. I think that's really great, but also a really great bunch of staff who are committed to teaching and researching climate and sustainability. And I say that right across the board. So obviously we've got three scientists here, but it's not just our scientists, you know, climate change that we're facing is, is you know, in large part also a human problem. And, uh, you know, we have great people here across the board. Um, how do we convince people to, to get on board with addressing climate change? What are some of the, you know, technological solutions we need to be pursuing? Uh, and, and, you know, how do we get our business community involved? How do we write the policy frameworks? How do we make sure that we're writing those policies and things based on the best science? So I think we have a really great group of people in the university ready and willing to, to get involved, um, I guess. And uh, what can Wollongong do more broadly? What are our, our biggest areas for impacts? I mean, I guess, um, so it, things like our energy system, what, what are we committed to renewable energies to, to, to keep the lights on? Mine keeps going off because uh, I'm not moving enough. Um, and then things like, what are we doing? See there, exactly. <laughs> right on cue, well done. Right on cue, I didn't plan that at all. Um, <laughs> what are we doing around uh, things like, you know, we turn over our computers every two years. That's a sustainability issue. Is there something we can do about that to, to you know, it's a perfectly fine computer. But looking at all those little things and where can we get big bang for our buck in, in reducing our footprint as a university, Students come into campus, I used to run a teaching activity with them trying to figure out how we can reduce the carbon footprint of how students get to campus. They actually had some really amazing ideas. So, so I think there's things that we can do as a university. And I think we've got some great research going on that's that's going to be able to contribute as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Nick or Andrew? Nick. Yeah, I just like to build on a little bit on what Helen said. And I think the diversity of the people that we have at the University of Wollongong is a real strength. And a lot of the, the problems with being able to tackle climate change come from crossing over disciplines. Um, so whether it's a, a way of crossing over between science and science communication and communicating things through through to policymakers, or whether it's the, the crossover between scientists and social scientists and um, and that sort of thing. Um, I think we've got a lot of strength here at the University of Wollongong in being able to do some of those things, tackle some of those things and have have high impact in that, um, which is really great. And um, some of the groups that we've we've been meeting with this year in, in the lead up to, to COP28 have, have kind of highlighted that as well. And um, particularly some of the collaborations my, my colleagues have across, across groups and across disciplines has shown that, that that can really have a, a big impact and make us really think outside the box um, in terms of solutions, in terms of the type of research we do and, and reach a bigger audience. Um, on a slightly more personal level, I think one of the things that potentially my work can do, and I don't want to talk for Andrew, but the, the role of, of models and statistics and things is really, really critical in this is in understanding like where we're working from so that when we try to make progress in the future, we know we've got somewhere to benchmark against. Um, there's sort of the, if you, you can't monitor what you don't measure, so we can go and make the measurements and we can see how things looked and what impact we're having as, as we continue those measurements in the future and use things like models and particularly statistics because the uncertainty around these things is really important. We don't want to say, oh, temperature's changed by one degree, but our uncertainty is one degree. Well, okay, so we don't know anything then. We really need to know how uncertain that is before we go waving numbers around and saying how much we've had such an impact without, you know, actually being certain about it. 
Um, but yeah, to be able to do that and and give that information and know what we're working against and what progress we're making, I think is something that we also at the University of Wollongong have real strengths in being able to do. Um, that's a little bit of a selfish thing because that's my my area, but um, yeah, I, I see that as a strength for sure. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Nick, Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Nick and Helen. Uh, so, so maybe expanding a bit on, on what Nick was saying. I think I think we live in a world where it's very easy to, to get some misinformation and uh, universities and uh, like the University of Wollongong, uh, we have the opportunity to, to, first of all, spend a lot of time on a project. Uh, so sometimes, especially companies or governments, uh, bodies need to provide a result fast. Um, uh, one bad the framework I was talking about took seven years, right? And universities give us the opportunity to do things maybe at a more cautious pace, uh, not to say slower, um, but uh, but of higher, but of very high quality. Um, so the so University of Wollongong has the strength that it gives us the opportunity to, to do things properly and also to, to give an unbiased opinion as to what is happening. So going back to the bottom up, top down approaches that, that Nick was, was talking about. Uh, so, so countries self report the emissions, for example, but uh, with the satellite data, although it's a very hard problem, as I was explaining before, to, to come up with the emission figures uh, from, from satellite data. Um, um, we can do that and we can do that without any political bias. We just look at the data and, and especially the role of a statistician is to not be, be swayed by anything else, but just to look at the data and make influences from the data. So, so I think yeah, this is the opportunity the University of Wollongong gives us to, to, to give these unbiased and best guesses as, as to what is happening uh, currently in the world. Best estimates, yes. Um... So as we uh, as we think about that, one final question to uh, to each of you: What do you, do you see as your role in the fight against climate change? Who'd like to go first? We've always gone to you, Helen. That seems unfair. Anyone else want to go first this time? Nick. Sure, I'll take it on. Even though I'm I'm not quite sure what my answer to that is. I mean, I've talked about the role of of measuring. Um, you can't monitor what you don't measure, and I, I think that's really important. I think we probably all have a role in perhaps, particularly myself, being a bit more vocal about things that we see um, and, you know, off, but offering solutions. So, you know, we often, we often hear people bring up problems without solutions. Um, and I think I think we need to be able to offer solutions. Um, we can't just expect people to change 100% of their lives overnight um, as well. So I think what we we want to be able to do is is encourage people to make small changes and encourage that by by actions ourselves, um, practicing what we preach. Um, some point in time, in the past, I realised I I don't like to get into and people may find this surprising, those of you who know me, I don't like to get into confrontations. Um, and I think another thing that I can do is, is rather than being confrontational, because a lot of people, if you confront them with something, so, and in this case, I'm talking about, you know, people who are, you know, chaining themselves to gates and things like that. And that can be, that. don't get me wrong, that can be absolutely very effective. But for a lot of people, you know, if you change yourself to the gate of, my farm, if I was a farmer, I'd, I'd be kind of annoyed. Um, and that's, there's a role also in there. And I think this is something that, that I can do and others can perhaps do as well that aren't the people who, who might go out there um, and, and really have some really impactful, but um, what I would consider to be drastic action is, is a role of diplomacy around it as well. And that means um, listening, to people who maybe share different views as well and, and getting in a, a conversation rather than a, an argument about it um, and, and, and trying to let science and, and speak for itself. Um, but yeah, trying to help people understand um, without necessarily telling them that they're doing something wrong, just trying to, to help them on a journey there. I think, I think that's something I should perhaps do better myself, um, but I think yeah we can't we can't all be the the big loud people. Um, so there's definitely a role um, in the background a little bit as well. Uh, 
I can go second this time if you like. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, Andrew. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I partially answered this question before. I think I think my role as a statistician or, or data scientist is, is really just to come up with the best possible inferences that that, that we can make from data. So, so that, that's what I see as uh, as my role. Um, uh, I'm not really in a position to to say what policies or what policy changes uh, need to be done to 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 curb uh, climate change, but I can say that something is probably needed <laughs> uh, from from what we're seeing in the data. It's it's a pretty dire situation. Um, so so yeah, um, and and also to promote the notion of how important uncertainty is, as Nick was was saying before, uh, when, when you just say an estimate, uh, you know, it's going to be a there's going to be a two degrees centigrade rise if we if we do this. Um, no, there's an uncertainty around everything, and that changes everything. So so if for example, you're hosting a wedding party, and uh, I tell you there's a 90% chance of rain. Of rain, uh, you probably do it inside. But if it's a 40% chance of rain, then probably you, you may take a risk, right? So um, uncertainty really affects decisions, and this is this is the this is the big thing. So we, we do need to report uncertainties whenever we are giving our estimates. Thanks for that, Andrew. Helen, your thoughts? Yeah. Look, I see a few different angles for this. So first, I, I really see a personal role. Um, I can't be out there talking to others about reducing their emissions if I'm not prepared to try and do that myself and lead by example. So most recently, I've been looking at, you know, I've always been a bit of a bike rider. So that's my a lot of my transport. But looking at what purchases I've been making that I could reduce emissions and, and you know, from a sustainability point of view as well. So that's sort of one aspect, a really, a really kind of personal one. That's not to say that it's all up to the individual. There's, you know, I, I can't change at the moment how Australia's energy system is providing me with water, for example. Um, but I have a career purpose as well that's about unlock, unlocking the potential in others to understand the world around us. So I, I feel a real um, role uh, in fighting climate change in educating the next generation of scientists coming through and others, you know, I'll be a cranky old person at some point saying, we told you so, but it's the next generation who are going to have to solve these problems and, and these problems are getting worse. So I really feel like it's my role to help unlock their potential to do that. Uh, and then the third sort of aspect of that is, is providing it like the other two, providing the best research and science um, platform um, for people to make decisions from that. So the best uh, quality of what, you know, what can we do? Um, so again, unlocking the potential in the scientists that work in my group um, to, to go out and do that too. So yeah, that's sort of my, what I try to do. And I guess participating in things like this to the more people, again, understand how the climate system works can appreciate the problem and, and understand and realise the gravity of what we need to do and how quickly we need to do it. That issue of engaging with the community broadly, uh, I think, is a common theme from uh, each of you and absolutely critical uh, to be part of that public discourse uh, with uh, the various uh, expertise we bring to that, uh, to that process. Uh, thank you to uh, people today who are sending in questions. Um, great to see some of those. And the first uh, question this afternoon, Helen, uh, is for you. Um, given that uh, mass bleaching uh, is um, affects what we can learn about past climates, are corals still good climate records if they are effectively dead? Or does the skeleton still hold some stories of the past? Yeah, they are still really important storytellers. And those fossil ones that I talked about, I mean, they are dead and have been dead for a while. So they record that snapshot of the time in which they lived. Um, sometimes, and we're now uh, looking at if we can pick up past bleaching events in these corals. So not all corals die during a mass bleaching. Um, they can recover. So there's we think there's physical markers in the skeleton, but also some geochemical markers that can point to there being a bleaching event. And um, one of the PhD students in our group has got some actual corals that were grown in tank experiments with changing temperatures. 
And so we're going to be looking, or he's going to be looking at um, at the temperature, at the chemical changes that have gone along with that that change in temperature. Um, the other thing that we can do with dead corals, and there are examples on the Great Barrier Reef today where whole reef flats have died. And again, um, Tara Clark Decker, a fellow in our group, is dating. So using things, well, uranium thorium dating, but it's a bit like radiocarbon dating to figure out when those death events occurred and then trying to figure out why we got these big um, big mass sort of dying. Was it, was it a mass bleaching event? Was it um, sedimentation? Was it a cyclone? Was it pollution? Um, and I think by understanding those questions, you know, we can figure out if we're working off an already shifted baseline or how resilient the reef is to these various different stresses. So, um, yeah, so mass bleaching, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we may well have, in fact, we may well have analysed a few that we think uh, that the geochem looks a little wonky, the bands look a little bit wonky, maybe that's a bleaching event. But that's, that's really, um, it's a good question because it's right on the, on the frontier of, of what we're trying to figure out as well. So dropped out for me at least in the middle of that, David, but I assume I'm this sure. is the right. question about um, about how conflict has impacted climate change. Um, exactly. Thanks, Nick. I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I do know there are some, some striking examples um, of things like gas pipelines being blown up that obviously have an impact in releasing methane. Um, another thing I guess to consider is Conflict has has driven a lot of technological development, um, and perhaps that that's a good thing. But perhaps also, if that had have been focused on developing alternative energy solutions rather than on conflict, um, we'd be in a slightly better place now. Um, so those are my thoughts. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Probably one more coherent and uh, yeah, I, I, I opinion. I can add something, Nick. Uh, thanks for that. So, uh, about uh, about thirteen years ago, I did a study on on the Afghanistan conflict uh, using the WikiLeaks data, and, and at the time, I just remember reading lots of papers. Uh, and one of the one of an interesting paper which came out at the time was was on the relationship exactly it's exactly this between conflict and climate change. It was rather the other way around that that climate change can cause conflict because. It makes areas which were habitable before uninhabitable, uninhabitable, for example, and that may cause people movement, uh, people to move, and, and that can can generate conflict. Uh, it can also cause uh, water security issues in, in some cases, and, and that's also something which can cause conflict. But it also works works the other way around. Um, so so conflict uh, can contribute to climate change in some ways, as as, as Nick uh, was talking about, but also because when when countries are in conflict uh, tackling uh, in, in enacting policies to and to combat climate change becomes a very low priority very quickly um, so tackling climate change generally incurs a cost uh, by the country and uh, irrespective of whether it's a developed or a developing country um, as soon as there's a conflict uh, you know you're not going to tell people to install solar panels and things like that so so i think these 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 two things actually affect each other uh, conflict can contribute to climate change and also the other way around. Thanks very much, Andrew. We've got just two more questions to, to round out the uh, the session. Thank you for people uh, who have submitted questions. Um, with uh, iceberg uh, A23A shifting around and concerns that it will collide with marine life on the seafloor, cut off trade routes, displace wildlife, how do we quantify impacts of new kinds of extreme events under climate change? Well, if we haven't seen it before, sometimes you can't. And that's what the surprises that, uh, you know, again, the paleoclimate side, we try to find those surprises, but nonetheless, we don't know necessarily what everything that's going to happen or, or when. Yeah, I'd agree with that, but I'm absolutely confident we'll find a way. Um, and 
again, there's, there's a role in technology here. So it's, it's not quite necessarily a new type of extreme event, but it was a new extreme of extreme events. And if we look back to the bushfires of 2019-20, and that seems like no time at all to go, of course, COVID's made that all a blur. Um, there was actually a really nice study that we were part of um, led by NASA. So Andrew doesn't get NASA to, all to himself. Um, that was able to look at, um, so there was there was a drought leading up to that, look at the impact of the drought, look at the impact of the fire, and then look at the recovery afterwards. And that's enabled because of all the new satellite measurements that are coming online. So in that case, we're able to look at changes in carbon dioxide. We're able to look at changes in, in carbon monoxide, which I mentioned before is a really good tracer for uh, incomplete combustion and it is emitted by fires a lot. So absolutely a massively good tracer for the fires that happened there. But then also to use satellite measurements of of greening. So basically the growth um, and recovery growth after the fires. Um, and that, that was the first of a kind um, to be able to look at that effect from fires. And it was enabled one because of the scale of, of those particular fires. Um, because they were such an, an extreme event, but also because we have these satellites like OCO2 that Andrew mentioned, and that was one of the contributing satellites here that are making these measurements and are making these measurements in increasingly better and better ways. Um, and so from that, we're able to look at that and look at the recovery and, and scarily enough in that case, we're able to look at what the recovery looked like and it was gonna take something like possibly up to 30 years for all the, the trees and, and biosphere to regrow from that, which would mean if if that burnt again within that period of time, you'd see a net loss in, in ecosystem um, due to just the, the sheer um, force and, and temperature involved in that particular fire. Thanks for that, Nick. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, we've, we've got to go to the last question and um... Uh, it is important uh, with integrity issues around COP28 uh, and some leaders saying there is no science backing uh, the phase out of fossil fuel. Uh, are scientists better trying to tackle misinformation from the top down or the bottom up? Thanks for that question. Who'd like to, to answer that in 60 seconds or less? Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it it really does require a whole of community effort and we've we've got to convince the leadership but we've also got to work with the communities in which we live uh, that that this is real that there is urgency and uh, inactivity is not a solution yeah if I may just say it's finding the way of communicating the message to the particular audience so and that means it's different for if you're coming from the top down or bottom up we need to be aware of how to communicate it better, I think, as well. Absolutely. And and that rests with us. We've got to get it right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, Helen, Nick and Andrew for their amazing insights this afternoon and for willingly participating in, uh, uh, in this luminary session. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear your thoughts, to hear the work that you're doing and the passion that you bring to that. Uh, I'd also like to thank Martin and Jill who bring this program together. Uh, they do a fantastic job. Importantly, uh, today's session has been recorded. Please share it uh, as it's made available with other people who may be interested in it. Uh, I know many people uh, wanted to be uh, uh, able to join today but haven't been. And uh, so it will be a great opportunity to share this with uh, colleagues, friends, uh, and uh, everyone else who um, uh, may have interest in this. Uh, have a wonderful evening and uh, thank you for participating today.